Welcome back to the Season 2 Invitational pregame show here at SCG Con Winter. We are at the Berglund Center in Roanoke, Virginia. Brought to you by our friends over at Ultimate Guard and Carnox. Boys, how are the chairs? So comfortable. Yeah. I'm so happy to be back in my Carnox gaming chair. There I spend the go. rest of my life in pain. But when I'm in the Carnox gaming chair, everything's fine. Everything's just A-OK. -okay. I'm too on edge. I haven't leaned back yet. <laughs> You're a little on edge right I'm there. a little on edge. Do you want to do a quick shilling or do you not? No, uh, Brian is Brian, such right? a good company man that yeah. he just, he, enough for both of us. Okay, yeah. fair enough. Uh, we're going to talk about Pioneer where you cannot play Leyline of Abundance. You cannot play. <laughs> I got cut off by a graphic. <laughs> Who's in charge of this? People are here for graphics, Cedric. Got, they don't care what you're saying. Rob just clicks a button. I, I can't. They can't hear me anymore. Somebody, I called an intern. Rob, you've been here for four years. What happened? Um, you here. Next, okay. He banned me like Vale. Mm. I got banned there. Uh, so as I was saying, Leyline of Abundance gone. Oath of Nissa gone. Felidar Guardian probably better that it's gone. Oh yeah. Vale Summer. Eh. Uh, who we'll knows see. Who knows what happened there? Just take your L and move on, we'll Cedric. See. Just we'll take see. your L. <laughs> we'll see. Abe Corrigan, well done. Also, congrats <laughs> to that Grand Prix win, Abe, who I think is here this weekend. Um, this green deck, this Todd Anderson fella, you know, he's done everything but win a darn tournament with the deck, yep. right? Uh, he went XO through the Swiss of a PTQ two weeks ago, lost in the finals, XO'd the Swiss again the following week, and then lost in the quarterfinals. So he just hasn't gotten the trophy yet, which can be frustrating, obviously, but uh, we can't deny the work that's being done here. Uh, now, the initial versions of this deck when Leyline and Oath were illegal, eh, pretty busted. But I don't know if those cards need to be banned or not. You know, you can, we can have those discussions until we're blue in the face. They are gone. This deck is still good, Brian. Yes. This deck yeah. is still solid, for sure. Still solid. Still solid. Okay. I think there's room. I think there's room to adapt to it at this point. Before, it was kind of broken. Like, okay. the, the whole Leyline of Abundance, Oath of Nyssa, into Nykdos thing was powerful. In fact, I think it's modern level powerful. We might see that on the modern side this weekend. But at this stage, there's no question that Mono Green Devotion stands as the safe choice for Pioneer. The deck is resilient. Todd has done such a great job really evolving this archetype, finding the best cards for every slot. You really can't uh, thank him enough for pushing this archetype forward and really setting the foundation for modern, or excuse me, for Pioneer, because we have something to attack now. And I think this is the tournament where players will start attacking. This is the time sure. to get aggressive, and this is the time to push Mono Green aside. And I hope for Todd's sake, he's ready to take the next step and move his deck forward, because at this point, people have to be prepared. You know how powerful this strategy well, is. Well, Todd's been winning about it. He's been, he's been, excuse me, he's been winning with it. He's been writing about it. He's been streaming with it. Everything one can do with a deck, Craig, he has done with regards to this archetype. He has literally been the pioneer of this deck yep. and has really pushed the format in a certain direction, kind of all on his own. Yeah. Now that said, I know a lot of people come this weekend. I don't, you have Twitter, so do I. Everyone's asking for Vivian. Yep. So a lot of people are looking for the cards for this deck, which could be really good for them or be really bad if someone's found something to beat this deck. Yeah, it, it makes me think of uh, Ross Miriam's article about Bolt the Bird. Sure. It's like, they've got all these redundant one-drop mana creatures you got to kill them on that first turn. If they untap with these creatures, potentially the game's just over. And it's interesting to see a deck that's so dedicated to a creature strategy that's still so resilient to mass removal because they've got so many Planeswalkers going on. So it's just like, you let them untap with this, they're going to slam a Nyssa, they're going to slam a four-drop Planeswalker. Sure, you know, you've got your Wrath of God, you clean up some of these creatures, it doesn't even matter. They still have so much velocity, they're just going to just finish off the game from there. It's really important that you don't get behind against these decks. So I think one of the key things uh, when you're trying to find an angle to fight back against these decks is something else that can keep up. Sure. I mean, you have to interact with them. Yes. You have to slow them have down to. because they're doing a lot of, they're doing arguably the most powerful stuff in the format, you know how much mana they can generate. But this deck is. I mean, there's an approach to beat this kind of strategy. No, no question. I, I think Craig's point about having a game plan is critical. Historically, there's been two ways to fight decks like this. You pin their mana, you kill all their mana creatures, they never get off the ground, or you have something that can fight big payoff cards, counter spells or discard spells. I run into a lot of decks right now. I've been playing a lot of Pioneer. I run into a lot of decks, I'm not playing Green Devotion myself, but playing against these different strategies, that I'm confident can do neither. They can neither 
handle the mana creatures early on in the game or interact positively against their big payoff cards. I think this weekend will be different. Okay. Uh, people will either be playing strategies like Mono Red that have the capacity to pin mana, pin resources, and shorten the game and prevent them from uh, resolving their expensive stuff that way, or have the right counter spells and discard spells to at least attack the top end, sweep away your mana creatures, and win the game from there. Yeah, I think, you know, the previous version of this deck when everything was legal, it could fight through all the hate. And it's just like, well, I have a ley line, and like, you know, I'm just kind of doing my thing, whatever. Oath and is redundant, and you know, you trying to kill my mana creatures doesn't really matter. I think things have changed a little bit now, yeah. Uh, and I think that's actually a really big deal. But has someone come up with the right strategy to fight against them? That's interesting. Now, you talk about red strategies and the fact you've been playing Pioneer a lot. There's a lot of discourse in this format about the fact that the removal is bad, and like Wild Slash is like a five dollar card now or something, which is <laughs> yep. kind of outrageous. But one could argue necessary. What do these red decks look like? What I mean, you said you've been playing a lot of the format. Give, give us a, a little bit of a breakdown of what you've been having success with. All right, so there's a lot of power in one mana creatures. Okay. There is no end of plausible one mana threats to be playing with. Right now, I'm playing. We can get, get into details. Why? Monastery Swift Spirit, Gia Two Lava Runner, Bowmat Curse. Courier and Soul Scar Mage. Okay. Fanatical Firebrand is plausible, especially with Mono Green being in the metagame. There are other one drops you could consider as well. Sure. A lot of people play Smuggler's Copter. I found the card to be quite bad in the deck. I'm playing with Eidolon of the Great Revel and Bayashino Pyromancer as my two drops. Okay. I have four Wild Slashes. I've even moved some Shocks into the deck to yep. try to combat Mono Green. It doesn't look great, but you need to be able to kill things on the first turn. Uh, a couple Lightning Strikes and some Wizard's Lightnings. Okay, so. You know, do people, are people playing life gain to combat aggressive red strategies, really? I know, like, Mono Green has Nylea's Disciple on the sideboard, sure. But, you know, is, is there just, like, life gain just kind of floating around in the format right now? It doesn't really there, appear to be. There the is not a whole lot of ambient life gain. Okay. It, it's not really part of the format. And the big thing is, all of the cards you consider to be good against Mono Red Burn, when you're looking at Modern or even Legacy, those cards really don't exist in the same way. Timely Reinforcements, Core Firewalker, I'm not running these cards. So the sideboard games are a lot more manageable. And you have access to Skullcrack. I prefer Ramp Pinching Ferocidon, but sure. wh whatever the case may be, you have uh, some plausible cyborg cards to cut off people who are trying to beat you with life gain as well. And Brian, I know you've been obviously diving a lot into Pioneer with the podcast with Jerry and everything like that, so what are your thoughts on aggressive red strategies coming into the weekend? There, there's a lot of power tied up. Like Patrick said, specifically in the creatures, uh, Eidolon of the Great Revel is one I love a lot. Another card I'm interested to see what people do with is Searing Blood. I think that's a card yeah. that probably deserves more play than it's seen right now. Uh, Ferocidon, great pickup. Any kind of life gain that is floating around uh, will be mitigated by that, but also the body is effective as well. The menace is quite relevant against a bunch of these decks, and I, I think these are strategies that still need to congeal a little bit. You still need to figure out exactly what you're doing against the broader format. You're very focused on mono green right now, and I think appropriately so. If mono green finds success in this tournament, it's the failing of the other players in the tournament. I don't think it wins on its own merit at this point. It's about people not accounting for it. So that's a great place to start. But if you're going to succeed in the format at large, you just need to have an optimized build. And I don't think we're quite there yet with mono red. Like you said, there's debate between Smuggler's Copter. There's debate between Skull Crack and Ram Rampaging Ferocidon. Stoke the Flames is a card I see some people consider. Other people completely pass on it. So this deck needs to get its identity. And I don't see a lot of people putting in the hours right now. We know Patrick is. Patrick's putting in the hours on a red deck, whether it's good or not. <laughs> Uh, it is good. Uh, yeah. I think it is good. I I, I'm very transparent when it's bad, but I'm doing it anyway. It is right. actually good. I, I, I totally think. believe that. And if players here at the invitation, I'll put in the hours, they could be rewarded as well with a red deck. Craig, any thoughts on kind of red-based aggressive strategies in the face of mono green and the format at large? Sure. So, so I think one of the appeals of the red strategies is that uh, the way that they combat the green deck it's still an effective strategy of executing their game plan when they're not playing against the green deck. So if you say, I have efficient removal spells, burn spells for the early creatures, and then I can attack them a lot, when you're playing against the non-green deck, your burn spells still just go to the face, so they're still good cards for your deck. They still execute your plan against other matchups. Um, you had talked about life gain not really being in the format. We have seen blue-white control be a tier two deck and that showed up from time to time. It has Sphinx's Revelation as its big top end card, which is super powerful and gains life. Um, you know, we were saying how you need a mix of the right counter spells and some sweepers in order to deal with planeswalkers, you know, the, the top end threats and the aggressive cards. And blue white kind of gets that. The only thing blue white does not have is that efficient early removal that we're used to seeing in modern. Yeah, no path to exile or anything yeah. like that right now, which makes it a little bit more difficult to play that kind of strategy yep. at the moment. 
So I, I did mention that there's a lack of life gain, and you know, I, while I do believe that to be true, there is a card, I don't know if you guys have heard of it, Oko Thief of Crowns, which makes food and gains life. Uh, and that is a thing that we're going to see people do here this week. I know, you've, Brian, you've worked a little bit with Saltai, and I think that's kind of your mid-rangey Jund deck of choice for the weekend. Um, any thoughts? Have we found the optimal build of this strategy yet? Um, you know, Veil being gone maybe changes some things with regards to Thoughtseize and Fatal Push. So I, I think those black cards got a buff. But I don't think Sultai is the deck that's best positioned to take advantage of that buff. I think things like Mono Black look super promising right now. Having a clock seems very important at this stage in Pioneer. And I'm a little concerned about Sultai's game length. I think you want to condense the games a little bit, not let them stretch on quite so long, because there are a lot of powerful cards in the format. And decks like Mono Red can keep up with you if you let the game stretch long enough, especially like Smuggler's Copter's builds that are consistently finding gas off the top, have Ramanap Ruins in play. If you let the get game stretch on too long, that's problematic, and Sultai has that flaw right now. So I'm a little bit lower on that build than a lot of people, and Craig, you know I want to play something yeah. like this. Like, this is where I am naturally pushed yeah. towards, but as it stands right now, these decks have actually not impressed me as much as I thought they would, because they have such powerful cards, right? They you do. think about Thoughtseize, Fatal Push, Oko, all these things can mush together. Jace Vrin, Vrin's Prodigy, yep. uh, either Treasure Cruise or Dig Through Time. These are absurd, absurd magic cards. Liliana. Liliana's another great one, yep. but you're being pressured so much early, and you don't really have the sweeper you're looking for in these colors. I mean, maybe you could do like Cry of the Carnarium type stuff, but sometimes that gets outsized awkwardly, so you're really getting pinched on having the right cards maybe someone found the secret sauce this weekend. That's what it's all about this weekend. It's just figuring out the right combination of cards, specifically to account for mono green, but to deal with the format on a larger scale. If someone pinched together the right mix here, maybe there's something special for Sultai. I haven't found it yet, though. I'll tell Craig, you that. Uh, Sultai obviously is a more reactive deck than a proactive deck, and it sounds like in this format you want to be proactive. Yeah, so it's interesting. What I think that this format needs to really break it up is for people that to figure out the combo decks. Okay. So right now, um, with the card pool we're working with, the creature decks are just so good, and they're so aggressive. So to show up with a mid-rangey deck to try to fight back against these aggressive creature decks is just really hard to do. But I think if a combo deck comes in and says, I can ignore your creature attacking me plan and execute my strategy faster, it actually makes room for that disruptive mid-range deck to come in and say, I can have good game against the combo deck. You, you know what I'm saying? Of course. So it, it, it'll just add a, a third ABC rock, paper, scissors, where right now it's rock, rock, rock. Sure. I mean, we're definitely there right now. And with the banning of Felidar Guardian, meaning that Felidar Guardian plus the Healy Rise not a thing, which was your combo deck, yep. that's like kind of gone right now. I don't know if there's really one out there. Patrick, I'll ask you in the interim. I'm sure you've run into Salt Eye or mid-range as strategies with your red deck. Does it feel easy for you? It's felt pretty easy, and I'm yeah. sure Brian can speak to this better than I can, but we have taken the mana for granted in oh, these yeah, the older formats fetches. for a long yeah. time. Yeah. My opponent played a Jace Friends Prodigy on turn two, and my reaction was, they're never going to flip this thing. Sure. <laughs> yeah. They're never, ever going to flip this thing. Sure. You're playing with a bunch of overgrown tombs and Yabamaya Coast and Watery Graves. You have, you're in the, the bad, uncanny valley of taking a lot of damage off of your lands and also being color screwed yep. a lot of the time, yep. especially because the pulls on the, on the deck can be a little bit awkward. You want to have green and blue early for so, cer certain things, but then double black on turn four for Kalidus or Languish or something, or Liliana, um, uh, the Last Hope. Yep. All, so your mana is really pressured and they don't cast two spells a turn very efficiently in a format where mono green and mono red are playing two or three spells a turn early and often. Yep. And I've punked them out of late games with cards like uh, Chandra, Torch of Defiance, and Ramanap Ruins. They aren't even necessarily favored if the game gets to turn six or turn seven. So I think that at least the builds I've run into have felt like they're in a pretty problematic space right now of not being efficient enough early, nor having powerful enough expensive cards to close the game out. I think if you want to do this sort of thing, that blue-white control is a lot better. The mana is a lot cleaner, and you know, if you, if you had to get paid off for four mana cards anyway, I think they have the best share of four mana cards in the format. Um, but I'm sure people will be in the lab with this and we'll see builds that are uh, much more precise, much more heavily iterated than the ones I've run into online in the last couple weeks. Well, let me ask you guys a question, and one of you can step in. What else is there in the format? What am I missing? Kephis. Okay. It, but, I mean, it's there. Yep. It, again, yeah. it's just about finding the right pieces. I know Emma Handy is excited about Kephis right now. She yep. wrote on SCG this week, yep. speaking about that deck. And uh, Evan Whitehouse had a top four PTQ performance on the Magic Online PTQ. And... 
All these decks look very rough right now, but someone's gonna figure this out at some point. This combo is too powerful, and like Craig said, you have to have some combo in the format. I think Kethis is a great way to introduce that. Okay, that is kind of overlooked a little bit right now. I did for, it's funny, you know, Evan's performance in that PTQ has very much gone under the radar. Yeah, We focus I think so. so much on Todd, and not, not even Todd winning, but getting second in that PTQ after he went undefeated and lost in the finals. We haven't even talked about the deck that he lost to, Simic Nexus. Sure. Which, uh, I mean, how good is that sort of strategy right now? I'm not sure. I mean, look, it cleaned up on top pretty easy. It's, and it's it missing Veil of Summer, Cedric. That, that's actually that, the deck no, that, actually matters. that, that got actually hit matters. hardest by yeah. the loss of Veil of Summer, which is weird. Yeah. I don't know if that was an intentional. I mean, the messaging behind the Veil of Summer ban didn't point to that as a reason for doing so. But I do think it benefits the format at large to have Nexus be a little bit weaker. Sure. And it took a significant hit from the ban. Has anyone seen any success with Dig Through Time or Treasure Cruise yet in any meaningful way? I mean, look, we were so influenced by cantrips and fetch lands and all the stuff that make it so easy to play that on turn three for one or two mana, and I don't think anyone's found anything for that just yet. No. So th there's a lot of just interesting, powerful cards, right? This is a very big pool, and we haven't completely figured it out yet. But or, some things I think people need to look at, where's our free mana coming from? Okay. Well, we do have a mox that we have access to. Yep. It's not nearly as good as some of the other moxes. We got to work a little more for it, but it's there. We have Dig Through Time and Treasure Cruise, which are some of the most powerful magic cards we've ever seen. But we don't have a good way to fuel these. We have got a new card in Emery, Lurker of the Locks, which can turn on our mox and fuel our graveyard. So I'm wondering if there's some sauce there, where we can put together a combination of these cards, have access to our graveyard, delve away the cards we don't need, and have all these synergies to help move that game plan forward. I mean, that on an initial level, it makes some sense. Like It feels like there should be something there. But I think also, Patrick, this speaks to your point. We've taken the mana for granted for a long time in these older formats, and the mana here is just difficult. It, in a way, it, it kind of encourages either monocolored strategies or, you know, a lot of one color and a small splash of another as opposed to just like, hey, I'm Jund and I can play all three colors and play double red, double green, double black. Like, those days don't seem like they're upon us right now. Well, well Treasure Cruise and Dick Through Time are, are busted magic cards. There's no question about it. But they have always been subsidized, and this includes when they were legal and standard, by the fetch lands. That's true. It's a different animal when you don't have access to polluted yeah. delta and flooded strand anymore. Now, there's still plenty of good, cheap interaction, but in terms of the historical game plan, which is crack some fetch lands, spin my tires a little bit can tripping, and now pull ahead with, with treasure crews, that play pattern doesn't really exist in Pioneer the exact same way. You could play with wild slashes and thought seas as your one mana cards to sort of fuel it, but that doesn't guarantee the same smooth velocity of accruing resources and putting stuff into my graveyard and then digging it or treasure cruising it all away. That play pattern has always been subsidized by cards that aren't really present in this card pool. I think they're still going to have their time to shine. I would be surprised if five years from now it's like, yeah, these cards are just legal and fine and they get played a little bit. Sure. I would probably bet against it going that way, uh, but a lot of the cards that have propped up Dig Through Time and Treasure Cruise over the years, including when it was, uh, they had their time in standard, aren't present here. It's a, it's a different animal, and they're much harder to facilitate in this format than in any format we've explored previous. Which I think makes for a unique format, and it's going to make for a unique first four rounds today, first four rounds tomorrow, and of course our top eight on Sunday, because our top eight is Pioneer. Now, who's going to be in that top eight? Who's going to win that tournament? Well, there's a lot of players here in the Berglund Center, and we are going to unveil our picks for who we think is going to win. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> I've just been told maybe not. You know what? I can verbally do it. Yeah, we could, we could say them I out loud, right? I can't bring up right? a cool graphic, but yeah. I can still tell them, Rob, I'm taking Todd. With a little less confidence than I did an hour ago, because I think it makes some sense that people are going to fight back against Green Devotion. I know a lot of people have tweeted about it and saying like they, they are looking for Vivian and all the other stuff, but it also, that might just be the loud minority, and other people have found ways to fight against this deck. Um, it's obviously the best deck going, it's not best deck strong. It is the most known quantity yeah. of Devotion coming, uh, Devotion is coming into the weekend, and Todd is the best Devotion player. So if that deck is still good, he's going to have a very good weekend. I do have some concerns about Modern and how well, how much he's played the format at the moment. But I will say this, and you and I have been covering Todd playing Magic for basically the whole decade. Decade, yeah. Uh, when Todd is locked in and playing a lot of Magic, he is very good. And when he's not, he's not. And <laughs> right now he's playing a whole bunch of Magic. 
And you'll know, and I'm sure we'll watch Todd at some point, you'll know if he's locked in by how fast he's playing. Yes. Because when his turns are just bang, 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 I think to the days when we used to watch him cast Treasure Cruise and deck through time with Jeskai Black, dude, you weren't beating that guy. Yeah. That's when he got second place in the Players' Championship. You weren't beating him. Um, if he's playing like that in, well, he'll, he'll play like that in Pioneer. If he's playing like that in Modern, he's going to have a good weekend. If not, and he's thinking more about his plays, I'm a little less um, enthused about the pick. But I do think, at least for the Pioneer half, which is where his tournament's going to start, it's probably going to start pretty well for him. On to you, sir. I selected Matthew Dilks. A good choice. And people got some short memories around here. Did he, you know? 15 opens played, top eight and eight of them. That's more than half. Fell off the radar a little bit. His participations in opens have been a bit more scattered after he secured himself a seat at the Players' Championship earlier in the year. People got some short memories, especially when it comes to modern. Um, Pioneer's kind of an open format, but the best decks are adjacent to the things that he does in modern. I think he'll be fluent there. And um, I, I think starting off with someone who you would bet on, at worst, a 6-2 or 7-1 performance in one of the formats, yep. uh, it, that's where I would, I would put my money down. Totally legitimate pick. Brian, over to you. I think Patrick has a solid choice, but I am concerned that maybe Dilks not left with anything to really play for. I mean, I know everyone wants to win an Invitational, but Dilks is going to the Players' Championship. That's what he's thinking about right now. Someone who hasn't locked up a Players' Championship slot, as it stands right now, but is unquestionably one of the strongest players here on the SCG Tour, Matthew Dilks' friend, Edgar Magiesh, who... Sure. It just feels like he's in need of a breakthrough performance because I promise you, he's one of the absolute best players on this tour. Works with probably the absolute best team on this tour in Team Lotus Box. Is just infinitely familiar with Modern, has been working hard on Pioneer, and he's hungry. He wants this Invitational win so, so badly. I think this is his time to shine. I'm picking Edgar for this weekend. Craig, for you, sir. So you're talking about players with a very high ceiling. I'm picking Noah Walker. I think when you look around the room, he's one of the players with the highest ceiling here. We, we, and hearkening back to what we said earlier, where it's uh, an evolution in the metagame where you want to be one step ahead of what everyone else is doing, I have consistently seen Noah Walker show up to the legacy events one step ahead of everyone else with his legacy decks. I'm hoping he brings that same dedication here to the other formats. They're pretty established at this point. So if there are angles to fight them, uh, if there's ways to be one step ahead, it's an established metagame and you can do that. So I, I have high hopes for Noah this weekend. I think he's one of the players able to just put those little innovations in the deck, into a deck that give him a big advantage. Nick Miller also picked Todd Anderson. So obviously I'm the smartest guy in the room because Nick knows things. But I don't want to. I don't want to sell anybody short money. here. We got we got Jerry Thompson here, <laughs> uh, former Invitational champion. Oh yeah. Brad Nelson here, former Invitational champion, mm -hmm. and a whole bunch of people who have had a fantastic year on the SCD tour. This is going to be a lot of fun. Um, this is the first big Pioneer tournament, and that's really cool. Yeah, yeah. I'm so excited. Awesome yeah, that, to be a part of that. That's really really cool. I don't know what that's going to look like. It's very easy to just say we're going to see a lot of mono green devotion. And that's it. But I don't think that's true. And I'm really curious, and players are working with short time to build decks. Everyone's underneath that same uh, kind of restriction. But, you know, restriction breeds creativity sometimes. And I'm curious to see what players are going to bring there. And if anyone's figured out how to beat this stupid Cynic Wars deck in Modern, because it's really, really good. <laughs> it is so good. It's really good. It's <laughs> also going to be interesting to watch as well. We've got a lot of great players behind us, but we're going to take a short break here from the Berglund Center in Roanoke, Virginia, before we get things underway. We're going to get our beautiful table set up, get ready to bring you eight rounds of coverage today. We're going to kick things off with the brand new format in Pioneer. So we'll see you guys back here at the top of the hour for all of that good stuff in just a bit.